With the casing already off, he's ready to continue disassembling the pump. The first step is to loosen the packing gland nuts. This is done to release the pressure on the packing and shaft, allowing it to rotate easily. First, he loosens the nuts with the wrench. When they're loose enough, he threads them almost to the end of the studs by hand. These pumps are supplied with glands that have either two or four studs. In this case, four studs are used. Next, the workman removes the impeller. To do this, he places an impeller wrench on the shaft. The shaft is rotated until the wrench strikes the workbench sharply. What happened was this. The impeller rotated with the shaft. But when the wrench stopped the shaft from rotating, the impeller tried to keep going a little. This caused the impeller to break loose from the shaft. It may take you several strikes of the wrench to break the impeller loose. Once the impeller is loose, it can be turned and removed by hand. With the impeller off the shaft, the workman puts it aside. He'll inspect it later on. The next piece to be removed is the end plate. The end plate is held in place by two cap screws, one on each side. The workman loosens them with a wrench. He places the screws in a plastic bag as they're removed. This protects them and keeps them from getting lost. If the plate can be installed in more than one way, be sure you match mark it to ensure it is reassembled properly. With the cap screws out, the end plate is removed from the pump assembly. He takes care not to damage the shaft as he slides off the end plate. Any nicks or gouges could prevent the packing from forming a tight seal. The only piece now holding the shaft in place is the bearing end cap. The workman takes it off by removing the four cap screws which hold it in place. As before, the cap screws are loosened with a wrench. Then they're threaded off the rest of the way by hand. Again, he places the cap screws in a plastic bag for safekeeping. Once the cap screws are removed, the cover is taken off. The gaskets are also removed. The next step is to remove the deflector. The deflector is made of Teflon and should slide off easily. The workman takes care not to damage it as he removes it so it can be reused. This part is also bagged. When we left the workman, he was ready to remove the shaft and bearings. Before we rejoin him, let's take a look at how these parts fit together. The shaft is supported by two bearings. The bearings are pressed fit onto the shaft. A slinger ring is also pressed onto the shaft. Its purpose is to sling the oil as it rotates forming an oil mist inside the bearing housing. This lubricates the bearings. The bearings are held on the shaft by a lock nut and washer. The lock nut is threaded onto the shaft 
and held in position by the washer. The first step is to bend up the lock tab on the washer so it clears the lock nut. To do this, the workman uses a punch and hammer. Several taps with the hammer may be required. Be careful not to damage the lock nut when you do this. Once the tab is clear of the lock nut, the workman places the impeller wrench on the shaft. He aligns the key on the wrench with the key slot of the shaft and slides the wrench on. This will hold the shaft steady while he uses a spanner wrench to loosen the lock nut. Notice that he holds the spanner wrench tightly on the nut to prevent it from slipping and rounding off the slots. When the lock nut is loose, he no longer needs the impeller wrench. The lock nut can now be rotated by hand. Don't spin the nut off. These are fine threads and may gall easily. After the lock nut is removed, the lock washer is free to come off. He places both the nut and washer in a plastic bag. The next step is to remove the snap ring. To do this, the workman bumps the shaft out a little ways. This gives him room enough to insert the snap ring pliers into the snap ring. Notice that the workman holds the ring in his free hand as it's removed. This keeps it from popping off. With the snap ring off, the workman removes the shims and stores them with the snap ring. These shims are used to set impeller clearance. The shaft is now free to be removed from the bearing housing. Take extreme care when removing the shaft and bearings. They fit in there snugly. As the bearings come free of their seat, there may be a tendency for the shaft to drop. Be sure you don't let this happen. If the shaft hit the housing, it could be damaged enough so that it would have to be refinished before it could be used again. The workman places the shaft on a set of roller V-blocks to keep the bearings off the workbench. He then covers the bearings to keep dirt from getting into them. Dirt in the bearings will damage them when they rotate. The coverings are taped on. This prevents them from being blown off or accidentally knocked off. With the bearings covered, the workman is ready to make out identification tags. These tags will identify the parts contained in each bag and will help the workman during reassembly. This is an especially good practice if a different workman were required to reassemble the pump. This may take a little time, but it's worth it. It will save you time in the long run. The more complicated a pump or job is, the more difficult it becomes to identify the parts. With the parts tagged, you'll know exactly what they are when you get ready to put them back together. With the tagging completed, the workman removes the gland nuts from the gland studs. Then the packing gland follower is removed. All the parts are bagged for safekeeping. Next, he's ready to remove the packing and seal cage. Since this is a new pump and the packing hasn't been compressed, 
the workman is able to pull it out by hand. If the packing were old and compressed, the end plate could be turned over and the packing pushed out. 